So an acclaimed NASA physicist and metaphysician extraordinaire, a deep, deep thinker, will you please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Thomas Campbell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Campbell. I'm a physicist, a consciousness researcher, a citizen, an explorer of the larger reality. I'm going to tell you everything that you will need to know. The slides are not critical to your understanding. That's uh, more or less, it's, the slides are just there for a record. And these will be posted up on my website. So if you'd like to go get the slides so that you can kind of be reminded of what it was we talked about. See, the slides are very wordy anyway, and uh, they're not really good slides as far as presentation go, but they were meant to be a record so that people could go look it up, see the words, and kind of get reminded of what was, what was being talked about. So don't worry about that. There's just one slide that's a picture, and I'll point at it. You probably, it's just kind of big, vague shape, so you'll probably be able to see that all right. If not, imagination will fill in. So that's not a problem. Today I'm going to talk about physics and love. Two aspects of one understanding. It's going to be a short tour of the nature of reality and the individual's place within that reality. But before I get started, I'd like to thank Donna Venny and Keith Warner of MBT Events, as well as Dan Glenn of Unity North, for envisioning and organizing this event. Also thanks go to the Reverend Richard Burdick and the Reverend Carol O'Connell, who will participate in a discussion panel after lunch. Okay, we're going to explore some of the implications of this scientific big picture theory of everything. Also thanks goes to Josh Myers who distributed posters around the Atlanta area and to Unity Church North for providing these wonderful facilities for us to experience what we're going to experience today. Okay. So today's program is going to be informal. I'm going to give a very short intro of kind of who's Tom Campbell and where did he come from. Then we're going to talk about some basic key concepts of the theory of everything, the, the theory of uh, existence and, and reality. It's going to be very light on the science today. I'm not going to show you any double slit experiment charts or anything like that. I, I did that last time I was here, and you know, a couple people got up and ran out of the room. So I, I think I won't do that this time. I'm going to limit the science to just talking about it enough to establish that what we're going to be talking about here today really is science. It's the result of logical process. Now, there's two reasons uh, why I, I feel like it would be, you know, we can skip a lot of the, the, the more, uh, you know, the details of the science. One, there's not enough time. We're only going to be here, I'm going to be here two hours speaking to you as a presentation. Then we're going to have lunch. Then in the next two hours, it's going to be a discussion with all of us are going, to, are going to have a discussion. And I think the discussion part's really going to be the best part because that's what's going to be unique and that's what's going to be something that's never been said or heard before. So that's always my favorite part is talking with the people. But first, I feel like I have to give a little bit of an introduction to what it is that we're, we're going to talk about. You know, n normally when I, do the, when I do the workshops, it takes about 14 hours of lecture to get out a rough idea of what's going on here. It lasts for two days, sometimes three days, and we're going to compress all that down to about two hours. So, and it's not that I'm going to talk that fast, but um, I'm going to just hit the high points. We're going to go through the whole theory, and I'm just going to hit the basic concepts, not all the connecting work, not all the derivations of the logic, but just here are the basic concepts for you to understand to get this big picture. So that's what we're going to skip through. So if you're a left brain individual requiring detailed logical derivations, this morning's presentation is likely to sound like a string of weakly supported assertions. That is, unless you have spent some time at YouTube or with the books, then, you'll be, then you will understand it at a more detailed level. On the other hand, if you're a right brain person, this morning's presentation will likely sound like a scientific, and therefore a little strange, explanation of what you've always known to be true. 
Okay. Now, let's see if we can make this work. Okay. In the beginning, okay, where did I start? Well, I was still in graduate school in, in physics, and uh, I ran across an advertisement for Transcendental Meditation. Come to the class, special, $25 for students. I know that, that's been a long time ago, right? Now it's $2,500, right, for, for people, but $25 for students. Well, I took that, that, uh, that course, and when I went into that course, I was kind of your typical scientist, your typical, um, you know, left brain, uh, um, what do we call it, materialist, reductionist, you know, sort of philosophy. Um, if something couldn't be measured, then it either didn't exist, or if it did, it wasn't important. Right? That's just kind of the way we see things in the science world. Okay? It was irrelevant, or it didn't exist if you couldn't actually measure it. Because if you couldn't measure it, then it was you know, not definable. It couldn't be measured, and it can't be defined. If it can't be defined, then what can you do with it? Oh, well, irrelevant. Okay, so that's kind of where I started. And then I took this meditation class. And then I found out that not only did the meditation kind of change me as far as my, my sense of self and being, but I found a very practical use for it. I could debug my computer code in seconds without ever looking at the computer code. And that was really something because it took me hours, if not days, sometimes weeks to debug computer code. You have to realize that was back in the bad old days where computer code was written in punch cards. There was no such thing as terminals. And it took somewhere, if you were lucky, maybe three days or four days, but typically a week to get a single turnaround. You had to haul your cards down to the computer center, and you turned your cards in, and they put them in the queue. So if you got one chance to see whether you corrected your error or not a week, if it took you 55 try or 50, you know, some try, 52 tries to uh, find your error, that's a year. You see, it was a whole different world. Now people try 52 different things to find their errors in five minutes. You know, it was a different world back then. So finding your errors in your code was something you spent a lot of time doing because runtime was precious. And I found out that I had like, I don't know, maybe it was a, in today's standards, it was a small program. It's maybe a four boxes of cards. And uh, you know, what's that, 10,000 lines or something. And with punch cards, it may not be an error in your code. It may be that one of those punch cards, the hole was just slightly off center, and that was the only problem. So you see, it was very difficult to find errors. Well, I could, do, I could go into a meditation state, and I could find the error. Basically, I'd just say, where's the error? And I could see scroll of data going by, and one of them would light up. That's your error. Well, then I'd go look the next day, and I'd go to that point, and there was the error. You see, so that was, that was wonderful. And I knew at that point that there was something larger to this reality than just the things you could measure. That there were connections that you could make through mind that transcended physical reality. That was a, a known. Otherwise, what I was able to do was impossible, you see. So that was my first eye-opener, that reality was really a lot bigger than what I thought it was. And for a physicist, that's a dramatic realization. I mean, what do physicists do? They model reality. And here I am, I've been through graduate school for you know, six years or something, and what I'm learning to do is model reality, mostly in terms of mathematics, but that's what we do as physicists. And so now I find out that this reality I'm modeling is only a subset. There's a much bigger reality out there that needs to be modeled. So that was my first eye-opener. And then a few months after I got my first job, I was lucky enough to bump into Bob Monroe. I don't know if you know Bob Monroe. He wrote three books, Journeys Out of Body, Far Journeys, and Ultimate Journeys. And he was a person that had 
experienced without trying to, just naturally and spontaneously experienced out-of-body phenomena. And then he studied it. And then he, he did experiments with it. And he wrote his book. And when I read the book, it was like, well, you know, what can you make out of this? Is the guy just making up stories to sell books or what? You know, is, is this guy nuts or what? And I got to meet him. And I found out that he was a very straight kind of person. He wasn't trying to sell anything. He wasn't trying to convince anybody of anything. In fact, he wanted to study consciousness to find out how did it work. He also was a very practical guy. And he just didn't want to be the old guy that did strange things. He wanted to make this science. So he was looking for a couple of scientists to work in this lab that he had just built to study consciousness. And I'm a physicist wanting to know how big is this reality and what does it do? So it was a perfect match. And Bob Monroe and I then were collaborators and others too. It wasn't just Bob and I, but a, another fellow that was, worked the same place I did, Dennis Menerick. He also was in a similar place to me and we both kind of latched onto the opportunity. And from then on, I spent about 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe. And the deal was he would teach Dennis and I out of body, exploring the larger reality, and we would be his scientists. And that worked that way. In, um, I don't know, six months to a year, two years, Dennis and I were going out of body, you know, healing with their minds, remote viewing, doing all these things whenever we wanted to. It became a very easy thing to do. And from then on, my goal was to understand it. How did this larger reality work? What were the rules? It was consistent. I was able to test that myself. It was very consistent. So there was something out there, some structure, some thing that was there. And all I had to do was figure out what are the boundaries? You know, what's the physics of the larger consciousness system, if you will? That was my, my goal. And I spent the next 30, 35 years working on that. And then about, I guess it's been now about nine years ago, in uh, 2000 and Three, February 2003, I published these books, you know, My Big Town, trilogy of books. And that was kind of the result of 35 years of trying to figure out just what was going on and how it all connected to this reality and, and so on. So that's kind of the, that's what brought us here. You know, that's kind of where I came from and how I, and, and how I ended up here. So let's go on. What I'm going to tell you is basically the results of what I found and how it fits in to this picture. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna, I am going to talk a little bit about physics, but uh, just enough to tell you, uh, you know, a, a, a scientific perspective for this. Physics evolves by becoming aware of ever bigger pictures. Science evolves that way. Okay, the old, smaller picture becomes a subset of the new, bigger picture. Here's some examples. At one time, all the smartest people in the world were convinced the Earth was flat. Okay? And that seemed to work. If you were just measuring out a, you know, a mile here or 100 yards there or something, and flat model worked pretty well. Okay? But then, of course, we got a bigger picture, and the Earth then was seen as round. But it's not that the flat Earth model went away. The flat Earth model is still used. It's still very accurate for short distances. All the surveying that's done to lay out your home, to lay out buildings, to sell property, all the surveying's done on a flat earth model. That's how they survey. They don't care about whether the ground goes up and down, they just, it's a flat earth. Good model, but it fits. It's an, it's an approximately correct model in that region where the distances are short. The next one was, we got to Newtonian physics. And when we got to Newtonian physics, suddenly we did have the round earth, we had a solar system, we had all sorts of new ideas, and that was replaced by relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, did Newtonian physics then have to go away because it was wrong? No. Newtonian physics works very, very well, but it's only an approximation to the truth. It works very well in that area where things aren't going too fast and they're not too small. If they're too small, then they're in the quantum mechanics area. If they're too fast, they're in the relativistic area. But otherwise, 
I'd say 99% of all the physics that's done out in the real world is still Newtonian physics. Because this world we live in hardly ever gets into phenomena that are relativistic in speed, nor to the size that quantum mechanics matters either. So physics is still mostly Newtonian physics, but it's only an approximation, you see, of a bigger understanding. The next step we're going to take is that relativity and quantum mechanics are going to be replaced by yet a bigger understanding, and that is that reality is virtual. We live in a virtual reality. Reality is just information. And that is an idea whose time has come. That's an idea that is gaining more and more credibility in the scientific community. Every year there's some, some more physicists, some more technical people that say, you know, this is really a better idea. You know, we, get, we, we can do better physics with this idea that this is just information. Well, what does that mean? That means we're living in an, you know, like a, in a simulation, if you will, that everything is just information. Now that's hard for people to get their head around, you know, how is this a simulation? But we'll get a little bit more into that, to that later. One of the things to notice is that every stage of the way from the flat earth up to virtual reality, we notice that the people at the time thought that their model of reality was the final model, that it was true, we're done, there's nothing else, nothing else makes sense. That was true with the flat earth, that was true with Newtonian physics, that's true now with quantum mechanics and relativity. People always think like, well, that's it, now we understand, you see? And that's why there's so much difficulty trying to move thinking to a bigger picture, okay? And we're, going, we're in the middle of that struggle now, and whether that will take another decade or you know, another century, I don't know, but that's where we're headed, okay? there's actually going to be yet another major paradigm shift. The first paradigm shift that's coming is that reality is virtual. The second paradigm shift that's coming, and it'll probably come some decade after the first, is that the computer, you know, virtual reality is computed reality, that the computer is consciousness. That's the second big understanding. And after we get to those two understandings, those two big paradigm shifts, then we basically will be able to understand everything. Now, put everything in quotes, right? Theory of everything. We'll be under, able to understand a lot, most of what we interact with and deal with. And that will be not only the objective, not only the, the, the science part of it, but also the subjective. Not only the normal, but the paranormal, because the paranormal will just be normal. It will, have, it will be as normal an explanation as you know, what's considered normal now. So not only physics, but metaphysics. And they'll all be one thing. So metaphysics, physics, philosophy, theology, all kind of come out as one thing. Different, different aspects, different viewpoints of one bigger thing, you see. So that's the power of what we're talking about here. That's really the point of it. Here are a few experimental facts that are unexplainable, entirely mysterious from the point of view of traditional science today. This is, these are some things that the My Big Toe Theory explains entirely and completely. Um, one of them would be PEAR Labs. PEAR stands for Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. It's been going on for at least 20 years, maybe longer. So it was a group of engineers first, and then they included quite a number of people out of their physics department in Princeton. Princeton's a very strong science house. That's where Einstein spent his last 20 years, was at Princeton. So these people know how to do science. They know how to do scientific protocols that are immaculate, that don't leave any room for you know, error. Particularly when you're working in an area that nobody believes even exists. You really want to make your protocols immaculate. You go to double trouble to do that. Well, what they found out is that mind affects matter. In their experiments, and they've done hundreds of experiments, mind affects matter. Mind affects physical results. Okay? That was, that's their bottom line. And if you go to the, if you, if you Google pair labs, 
you'll get, a, you'll get their website and they'll have a little movie that you can click on that'll run and he'll tell you in that movie that if you take the results of all their experiments together, the odds that they got the results they got just being chance, in other words, it's just lucky that it happened that way, is something in excess of one in a billion. Now, nobody does science to that level of specificity. Generally, if you can get to one in a hundred or one in a thousand or something, your, your results are considered, considered firm. You know, that's good science. If you take all their results, they're one in a billion that the results that they've got were just somehow flukes. Real solid science at Paralabs. What about the placebo effect? Everybody knows what that is. Placebo effect, very fundamental part of medicine, right? Matter of fact, if you can't beat the placebo effect, you can't market the drugs in this country. Placebo effect, mind affecting health, right? That's impossible in a completely just physical reality. In an objective reality, that can't happen. It doesn't, you know, all those cells and all the biology and all the physics and all the atoms really don't care what you think. They're just doing their thing, right? <laughs> it's impossible. Your body just works by the laws of nature, right? Your thoughts about it aren't, aren't relevant, but we know the placebo effect is very real. So that's another mystery. How does that work? Uh, you go on to the YouTube, and most of you have probably seen Dr. Emoto freezing ice and how his crystals change based on the thoughts and the kinds of attitudes he has. Uh, you've probably seen uh, Dr. Tillman uh, uh, with uh, his glass of water, raising and lowering pH by concentrating on it with mind. There's all sorts of reverse causality experiments that you can find that have been done. There is no such thing really as reverse causality. It only looks like reverse causality because of the assumption of an objective physical reality. So reverse causality means you do something now and something in the past changes because you do it now. See, it's a reverse causality. The cause comes first, the effect comes later, but here you're doing something and you actually affect something that's already been done. That doesn't actually happen, but it appears to happen if you believe that this reality is, is um, objective physical and objective. So there's lots of different kinds of reverse causality experiments. And uh, even quantum mechanics has reverse causality you know, experiments in it that work. And these are all big mysteries. Quantum mechanics itself is a big mystery. Why should reality be probabilistic and statistical? It doesn't make sense. Reality's got to be this hard little matter stuff. Well, they find out it's just probability distributions. Entanglement. Two particles are entangled. They get very far away from each other, and you flip the spin of one, and the other one flips automatically. Well, one's this way, one's that way. They go like this, okay? And that can be done so far apart that there couldn't be a communication between them because they flip faster than light would take to go from one to the other to tell that one that this one flipped. And how does that happen? It's a big unknown mystery. Then there's other things, um, you know, like uh, the expanding universe. What is it expanding into? What's out there on the other side of the universe that it's expanding into? You know, the Big Bang. All right, we started from this little point of high temperature, high energy, and then it evolved out into our universe, but where did that little point of high energy, high temperature start from? What was its cause? You see, well, none. There is no cause there. And then we get into, uh, like Bruce Lipton's uh, DNA being affected by mind, uh, Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields, crop circles, you know, random number generators, uh, correlating major events you know, around, the, around the world. Uh, all of these and many other experimentally driven phenomena that remain beyond the ability of traditional science to explain are given a logical explanation and a solid scientific foundation by the My Big Tao theory. Furthermore, none of the experimental facts of science are inconsistent or incompatible with my big toe theory. However, there's much scientific opinion, belief, and dogma that is fundamentally incompatible with the my big toe theory, but none of the facts. All right, now at the other end of the philosophical spectrum, my big toe explains the big picture, you, your origin, your purpose, what you should be doing to fulfill that purpose. MBT, that's my big toe, MBT, defines love 
in terms of entropy and evolution. It derives the one, the agent of creation, the creator of all that is in terms of the larger consciousness system. And all of this from one scientific, logical view of the nature of reality. So you solve the science problems, you solve the metaphysical problems, you say something important about theology, you say something important about philosophy. All of this kind of falls out in, into, uh, into one package. So that's about all the science we're going to do. Okay, uh, this is the one that uh, you can probably see these blobs. You probably can't see, but right there in the center is a little red dot. And that's what I'm talking about here is systems inside of systems inside of systems, right? like a Venn diagram where you have systems inside of systems inside of systems. There's a little tiny red dot right at the end of that arrow, and then there's this little blob around it at the end of that arrow, then there's this system, and then there's this bigger one. So we're just showing things inside of things inside of things. All right, and the point I'm trying to make here is that there are limits to what you can know and that these limits aren't a failure of your ability to understand or, or do proper analysis or find out the right facts. They're just theoretical limits on what you can understand. In other words, you can only understand so far, and, after, and that then is the end of your reach. And the way I explain that to people is, imagine that this little, uh, that little dot, imagine that that is bacteria in your, in your uh, small intestine. Okay, let's say that's a bacteria in your small intestine. And then this next thing out would maybe be the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract. Okay, the next one out here would be your body. Right? That's the next bigger system out. And then the next big system out here would be the food production. You know, the pigs and cows and grass and crops and tractors and, and uh, refrigerators and grocery stores and all the thing that ends up in food that goes into the GI tract that the bacteria work on. Okay, so these are systems inside of systems and kind of systems. And the point is, think of those bacteria in that stomach, in that intestine. Even if they were brilliant, even if they all had IQs of 200 and were all had PhDs in science, okay, these are brilliant bacteria. What could they know of the GI tract, well, they could know some of that. They could kind of explore up and down that GI tract. They could pass messages around. You know, they could get into the GI tract. What about the body? What are those intestinal bacteria going to know about your fingernails, you know, your eyes, your kneecaps, your skin? What can they know about that? How can they get a sense of this body? Well, that would be tough, wouldn't it? But if they're really, really smart, maybe they could get a some kind of a note. I don't know how that would happen, but we might even guess that, all right, that's kind of outside of outside of their realm. But let's go one more. What about the food production system? What about out there? What could those bacteria know about sunshine, rain, germination, plants, you know, horses, pigs and cows, tractors, farms? economics, tractor trailers that move produce, grocery stores, refrigeration, all the stuff that allows food to come down to them. Now, what, what is their view of the world? From their view of the world, food dropping down through the esophagus is manna from heaven, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, mystical. They don't know where that comes from. It just happens. But is, there, is their function dependent on it? Absolutely. It's very important even if they don't understand where it comes from. So my point is that if you're intestinal bacterium, there's just no way, even if you're brilliant, that you will be able to understand this larger system out here. It's just beyond your reach. You can't get there. Well, we're in the same boat, you see. Here we are in this little red dot, and that little red dot is our universe. The whole universe, everything, all the galaxies, everything. That's the whole universe is that little red dot. Now around that little red dot, the next one, okay, that is what in my books I call our system. That's the kind of the, the physical universe and all the non-physical that interacts with that universe. But that's not all the non-physical. And I'm just saying non-physical as if it's not physical. If it's not in our physical universe, then it's everything else we'll just call non-physical. Okay, I'm not going to try to explain. I would say everything else. 
Okay, and then what's outside of that? Well, that's the larger consciousness system is outside of just our little system. It has to do with this universe and the part of the non-physical that supports this universe. Okay, now, so this is the larger consciousness system. And what's out here? That's why I put it in a dotted line. Well, who knows? We're consciousness. How can we get outside of consciousness, you see, to look back on consciousness as an objective thing and make some assessment about what's outside of consciousness? Well, now we're like that bacteria. You know, how can we do that? Well, we can't. We're consciousness. We can explore. I mean, it's enough that we get out of our physical universe into our system, into the larger consciousness system, but eventually we get to the point that, all right, we're ignorant. We don't know what might be beyond that. But does that mean it's not important to us? Not necessarily. You see, it might be. It might be part of some other causal chain that we don't know. So the point here is, the bad news is, you, don't, you not only don't know everything, but you can't know everything. And that's just a fact, a logical necessity, rather than a failure of understanding. It's not that you just don't have enough data to understand that. There are limits to what you can understand. See, and that's, a, that's kind of a big idea. We fear uncertainty. You know, we talk about things being infinite, and a lot of people would say, well, this causal chain from this to this to that to the big one keeps going out, and it's infinite. Well, we don't know that it's infinite. In fact, we know that it's not infinite. Why not? Nothing is infinite. In infinite, infinity, is just a abstraction, right? Now, if you use infinite, if you use the word infinite as a metaphor for really, really big, bigger than you can imagine, then fine, this could be infinite. But that's not what infinity really means. Infinity really means beyond what can be counted, beyond what can be summed, what can be added. It's more than that. So in math and in physics, so you, you'll find out that you can never reach infinity. You can only approximate it. You can only get close, but that getting close goes on forever, you see. You can't ever really get there. So infinity is not something you can get to, because if you could get to it, oh, you could always add something to it, and now you'd have something bigger than infinity. Whoops, that's not right. You can't have anything bigger than infinity, you see. So nothing real can be infinite. Now, it can be so big that it's beyond our comprehension, and we can call that infinite just because that's a word that you can use to mean that, really, really big. But you have to realize that if it's a real thing, it can't actually be infinite. If it's real, it has to be finite. And if it's finite, it has to have boundaries. And if it has boundaries, then there's probably something on the other side of that boundary. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, you see. It's past our ability to say anything about it. So we get into this kind of stalemate of knowing here, we know that it's not an infinite series. It can't be if it's something real. And here we are, you know, we're, we feel like we're real. So we're in a real situation. Then we can't go, go further than that. But we fear uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty. It makes us feel uncomfortable. So we talk about the infinite universe when we know the universe is an infinite. We talk about, um, you know, infinite consciousness system. It's not infinite either. It's just beyond our conception of size. Size doesn't even, isn't even a, an idea outside of a physical virtual reality. Size, weight, volume, those are all physical virtual reality concepts. Once you get out of this physical reality, size, weight, volume doesn't exist anymore. You're outside of that, you see. So this whole idea of more isn't even meaningful outside of a physical virtual reality. But we use the word anyway. We talk about, you know, infinite conscious system, an infinite God. We talk about infinite things, but what we really mean is just bigger than we can understand. That's what we really mean about that. But what comes with that understanding is that there are boundaries. Finite has a boundary, and there's bound to be things outside that boundary, you see? And that's a kind of a profound concept. But what's outside that boundary? And it's not because we're just not smart enough to know, and someday we'll get the data that'll tell us, it's that we can't go there. We get to a point where we can only go through so many of these systems within systems, and after that you just have to say, well, 
here's our knowledge, and this knowledge will let us learn this. Now, how do you know whether you are, uh, wh whether you've actually learned most of what there is to learn that you can learn within your, within your system? Well, one of the ways you, you figure that out is, are there a lot of unanswered questions? Does your understanding of reality, is it complete? Does it really explain everything? Or are there a lot of these nagging unanswered things that just are mysterious and you can't figure out? Well, if you're in that place where most, a lot of your, your, your problems you just can't figure out, then you're probably not out as far as you can go in this. There's probably another, remember we started out with the physics, you get bigger and bigger pictures, and they keep expanding. Well, there's probably some more expanding to do yet if you can have these problems that are mysterious and don't seem to have answers. Probably. I mean, you don't ever know for sure. But that's an indication, anyway, that there's some more expansions, bigger pictures that will, that will help you out. Okay, the other thing that's important is that uh, though we can't know everything, we actually can know a whole lot, including almost everything of practical significance. Okay, we can know that without knowing everything. And a fact is, just because one can't know about something directly, doesn't mean that it isn't virtually important to you. So the things that we don't know doesn't mean they're not important to us. We have to live with that as well. Okay, here's an observation. The smaller your reality, the more convinced you are that you know everything. And that's true whether you're a two-year-old, a teenager, a philosopher, a theologian, or a physicist. It's true. The smaller your reality, the more convinced you are that you know everything. All right. Watch this. Yeah. Let's, talk, uh, let's talk about where does the larger consciousness system come from? Okay. What is it? And when I say what is it, that means how do we best model it? We're talking models. You model something. Science makes models. Then they make the mistake of believing that their models are real. Okay? But everything we do is a model. Okay? It's the way we think it works. But that's as close as we can get. We can only do models. We can't get behind the model because all we can experience is, you know, the, is what the, uh, you know, the result. We don't experience the cause. We experience the result here. So we can make models about what the cause might be. Okay, so this is a model. My big toe is a model of, of uh, everything. A theory, it's a theory of everything, but it's a model. All right, well, you've probably heard of the word emergent complexity. That means kind of a spontaneous entropy reduction. I'll tell you in a minute what, well, I guess I ought to tell you what entropy means if I'm going to say that. <laughs> entropy. Entropy reduction means more order, more useful. Entropy is a physics term, actually comes out of second law of thermodynamics, came up with a, a concept of entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So if things are disordered, then you have high entropy. If things are ordered, you have low entropy. Okay? So if you have randomness, high entropy. If that randomness congeals into some sort of content or meaning or significance or structure or anything that's ordered, you have the system then at lower entropy. All right? So when you look at your children's rooms, high entropy, right? <laughs> An information system works with entropy in the same way. If you have information, if in an information field all the bits, let's say all the ones and zeros, are just randomly spread around, it means nothing, just randomness. But if you can coalesce those into things, maybe you coalesce letters into words rather than just the alphabet being spread around, then you start to get meaning, you start to get content. So you see, you lower entropy, content starts to evolve, and there's a thing called emergent complexity where they have found that systems that have the potential to evolve in something that is more useful to themselves will just spontaneously do that. Well, there's nothing magic about emergent complexity. It's not really a magic thing. It's just that old friend of ours, evolution, right? If you've got potential, you apply statistics and probability to that potential. And what I mean there is that there's certain probability that things will go together in an interesting, useful way. 
And it may take a long time of random stuff before they just happen to go together in that useful way. It may take a lot of trial and error to get there, but once it happens, oh, that's useful. The things that work well, the things that meet the criteria of the system for survival, survive, and the things that don't, don't. And that's how evolution works. Now the criteria in our biological evolution is what? Procreation, survival. You have to survive, you have to procreate. If you don't do that, we disappear. So those are the two criteria. And if something happens to evolve in our physical soup here that on this planet that was better at survival and sustaining itself, well, it stayed. And things that didn't went away. So that's this, this whole concept of emergent complexity is really just the concept of evolution working on a system that has the potential to develop into something. Okay, we'll look at the biology. Uh, where'd that first cell come from in Darwin's theory of evolution? You can start with a cell, and from there on, Darwin's got it pretty well covered. You know, the cell grew, it, it split, there's multi-celled things. Pretty soon the multi-celled things had the cells specialize, and they got more complex. What's more complex sound like? More order, right? More survivable. And uh, they grew, in, and here, here we are, right? Here we're up at this end of the chain, and here, here we are. Here are all the dogs and cats and horses and the trees and the bushes and everything then came out of that that cell evolving, okay? Well, that makes us a product of emergent complexity. So that's, what, that's what we are. So um, evolution through the application of probability and statistics will eventually create lower entropy subsystems within a supersystem if the supersystem contains the potential for such a subsystem. That's kind of the way scientists would say that. Assumption one in my big toe is that there was such a supersystem with a potential for consciousness, that that existed. That's basically the assumption that consciousness exists. Well, here we are, we're conscious. The assumption that consciousness exists isn't really a big stretch, right? Darwin had the same problem. Here we are, everything we know is composed of cells. Everything, the fauna, the critters, everything's composed of cells. All living things, you know, they have cells. So there were cells. You know, he starts then with a cell and evolves out of that. So we do the same thing. And you, can, you might say, well, where does that first, where's that system with that potential come from? Well, I don't know, you see. We start with that assumption. And uh, it just was emergent complexity. It wasn't a physical system. It was what we would call non-physical in this virtual reality. So it wasn't a physical system. But that's why I did the slide before. We have to realize that you get to the point where you say, I don't know, that that's a natural and necessary limitation. It's not that you're ignorant and you just don't, you know, it's not that you, you've got to a point that, that uh, you just don't have enough information. It's just you've got to a point where you can't go beyond. We are consciousness. To go outside of consciousness to see what was going on there is some place we can't go. All right. Assumption two, by the way, is that evolution exists. That given a complex system, uh, a large complex system, change happens. Okay? And changes that meet system criteria for success, whatever those criteria are, persists. Okay? Now, in, a, in an information system, what are the criteria for success? Lower entropy, from randomness to content, to structure. Okay, so that's the criteria for a consciousness system to evolve, is that it forms lower entropy subsystems within itself. Just like in biology, it's procreation and survival. So the simplest implementation of the concept of emergent complexity is the simple evolution of just a binary pair. All that has, doesn't have to evolve what, an amino acid, maybe a couple of amino acids that tend to be in the right place at the right time and go together and make a first cell? Okay, that's kind of the emergent complexity that Darwin needs. All we need is a emergent complexity of something that's this or that, one or zero, yes or no, hot, cold, off, on, acid, base, whatever, you know, just something that then can become ones and zeros. And then, of course, that splits, you know, just like the cells multiplied because multi-celled things are more survivable. Well, in, in, in information, multiple ones and zeros can give more content, 
more information. So that's the natural way it would evolve. So we're talking about a natural system and natural process of evolution to produce consciousness. Okay. Now, so if that's where consciousness came from, where did we come from? What's our point in this? I call us individuated unit of consciousness. Here we are, all these individuated units of consciousness. And so why are we here? We were just talking about this big consciousness system was a, a, a system that evolved according to lowering its entropy, creating content. And the content was just digital information. Where does that go? Where does that evolve? Give it 100 million years or a billion years. Years aren't even defined in our terms, right? Give it however long it takes. Okay, what does it come to? Where would it go? Where is its path of lower entropy that it would follow? That's where now we come from. Okay, an information system. Think about an information system. What does it do? Well, it creates and operates on information. It needs to lower its entropy and build complexity. How does it do that? Well, it begins to specialize, just like the cells did, right? It begins to multiply. It begins to specialize and share information. That's what informations do. They make information. And to raise the complexity, in decrease the randomness, you share that information. Different points of view, different ideas, different concepts of the information suddenly bring up lots of novelty. So this is the way that evolution would go, okay? But the sharing has to be with free will. It doesn't mean anything if it's all scripted, right? Then you haven't actually reduced entropy. All you've done is rearrange the, you know, you've rearranged the one and zeros, but you haven't actually created anything new if you don't allow these entities to have free will. And as it turns out, with a lot more logic than I'm, than I'm giving here. Consciousness and free will are a match set. You cannot have one without the other. Free will is a necessary part of consciousness, and consciousness is a necessary part of free will. The two of them co-evolve, if you will, together, just like chickens and eggs, you see. Which came first, the chicken or an egg? Well, I can't get a chicken without an egg, but I can't get an egg without a chicken. So, gosh, you know, that's a deep problem. Well, the answer is obvious. Chickens and eggs evolved together. The system of chicken and egg, you know, was an evolved system. They evolved together. Well, that's, that's what we have here. Okay, and next I want to explain free will. What is free will? Most people don't understand the concept of free will. A lot of people think that free will means that you get anything you want. You know, if I had free will, then, you know, I'd be rich and handsome and, you know, so on. But I obviously don't have free will because I'm not. That's the idea. That's not free will. Free will isn't that you get any, everything you want. It's free will is not a, a genie in a bottle that gives you unlimited wishes. Okay, free will is a very simple concept, really. You have as a consciousness what I call a decision space. And... You won't find that anywhere. It's a term I, I made up. I have to make up a lot of terms because I'm in areas that nobody's gone before. So you end up making up terms. So decision space is one of those terms. You have a decision space. That decision space is finite. What is that decision space? It's all the decisions, all the choices that you can make. It's not necessarily all the choices that you have. There may be choices that you could make that you're just not aware of because of your fear because of your lack of information, because of your attitude, because of your beliefs, whatever. So it's just the choices that you can make. And when you come to a situation that requires you to make choices, which is every 10 seconds, right? It's all the time. You make one of those choices. So here you are, and you've got 20 different choices you can make given this situation, and you pick one of them. That's all free will is. You have the free will to pick the choice of what it is you do, you know, think, intend, actually, next. And that's all free will is. Okay, so now we look at that. Gee, free will could even be implemented on a computer, couldn't it? If you had objects in your computer that were individual, you know, they'd have to be fuzzy. They couldn't be algorithmic. They'd have to be things that had a lot of uncertainty with them. 
So they made uncertain choices. They weren't all just optimized choices because they don't have all the knowledge to make optimized choices. They're always working on a less information than they need to actually make the decision. So they're all kind of fuzzy choices. You could implement free will on a computer. You could have an array of different choices and this little computer thing could have limited awareness because of its history, right? Because of what it's gone through, its environment, the kind of lessons it's learned up to this point. And here's this finite array and well, here's a problem and I'll pick that one, right? So, you know, the choice could be random, but probably not. There's probably something in its experience, things it's done before, it learns as it goes. This would have to be a learning thing. So you see, free will isn't this, this thing that, that, that we often think it is, you know, this, this big idea, because once you put it up on that, that kind of global absolute scale, then you have problems, you know? That's why people have been arguing about free will for, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries, because they don't really understand what free will really is. It's the freedom to choose. It's the freedom to have an intent and then do something. That's all, very limited. Okay, next we'll explain love. Now we've talked about consciousness and it naturally would evolve to have multiple cells of itself, if you will, multiple things. It's like the, the biological cells had multiple cells because that's more complex, more survivable, more powerful, does more things. So consciousness has a lot of these individuated units of consciousness. They interact with each other with free will. Okay, so we've got to that point now in our logical structure. Now, what about love? Okay, so that's really not about a consciousness. It's about groups of consciousnesses, right? It's about a society of consciousness, things, interacting with each other. Okay, now what's the optimum way that this society of conscious entities can interact with each other? Which way leads toward more evolution? The evolution of consciousness. Well, if you think about it for a minute, love is an obvious answer. Okay, and one of the ways I, I, I explain this is look at, um, you know, take a, take a society of 10,000 people and put them someplace and let's all and give them a certain amount of um, resources and certain amount of structure that they have to work with and let all those 10,000 people interact with each other with love which means they care about other it's not about them it's about others somebody discovers something they share it if somebody finds a better way they share it if somebody finds a you know gold in the mountain they share it or maybe they don't even find it useful, you know, maybe uh, whatever. But they care about others, so you expect them to be cooperative, supportive, very interactive, right? Sort of the way some of our society used to be a long time ago. Somebody's barn burns down, all the neighbors gather up and build them another one. You know, now let's take another 10,000. And let's say they're based on the opposite of love, they're based on fear. Fear is the opposite of love. Okay, now. Give them the same resources and the same whatever and let them go. And what do you have? Well, immediately you have hoarding. This is mine. And now I have to protect mine from you taking it away from me. We have belligerence. We have what's in it for me. Why should I help you? Why should I help you build your barn back? Matter of fact, I'm the one that lit that fire because I was trying to eliminate, eliminate competition on the market, right? So that's what you have. What happens in these 10,000 people is that they start to pull apart because fear is divisive. Fear is high entropy. It breaks things apart. It's not cooperative. Pretty soon they would start to, you know, they're gonna battle with each other, right? Because it's all about them. And then they're gonna, gonna they wanna to have form little mutual protection groups so that this little group can protect them from this other group because groups are more powerful than individuals. And then those groups would fight each other, and pretty soon you have what we have here, right? Pretty soon you have this physical matter reality, whereas a few of these groups own 95% of all the resources, and everybody else has to feed that machine. You know, that's kind of the way that'll work out. Well, here we are. We, kind of, we can see how that experiment's already been done, right? We can see that. But we can imagine that other experiment where everybody was cooperative, helping, trying. Now, which one of those two systems sounds like the lower entropy? See, the more ordered, the more constructive, the one that builds and grows and constructs. Well, obviously, love 
is the optimal way in which people can interact. That's what moves consciousness toward greater and greater evolution. So consciousness evolves by lowering its entropy. Consciousness evolves by becoming love. So you see how those two go together? Lowering entropy is the same as becoming love. What is love? Love is the characteristics of a low entropy consciousness. That's the definition of love. Okay, so hopefully all this is kind of building to a, you know, a logical, logical uh, process. Okay, so the larger consciousness system is the result of evolution of a natural system. It's just a natural system and it's evolving and it's finite and evolution of consciousness means reducing the system entropy and that means moving toward love and here we are individuated units of that and what are we supposed to be doing moving toward love growing up why are we here well we're part of a larger consciousness system who wants to evolve because the only the only other choice other than evolving is de-evolving no large complex system can stay the same you either evolve or you de-evolve so if you, want to, if you want to exist, then what you want to do is evolve. To do that, it breaks into pieces. Here we are, we interact. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be evolving the quality of our consciousness. And as we evolve, it, it, the larger consciousness system evolves because we're it, it's us, we're all part of this one thing. You know, you've probably heard in the Eastern, Eastern theology says, we're all one. Well, we are all one. It's literally true. It's a consciousness system. We're pieces of it. Okay? And what's our, what's our job here? To grow up, let go of the fear, get rid of the ego, get rid of all the high entropy stuff, and move toward love. So that's kind of, we're getting a lot out of the science, aren't we? You know, not only we solved the Paralabs problem, but we're solving some other problems as well. Now, all of this is a model. Like I said, this is just a model. How do models get evaluated? And science, science makes models, even if they, they do believe in them later and think that they're real things. They have ways of telling whether a model's a good model or not, because all models aren't good models. The way you tell that a model's a good model is, what good is it? What does it do for you? you know, what can you do with it? What can you predict and then verify? What does it explain as far as the facts go? That's what makes it a good model. So you can have all sorts of models, but if the model doesn't give you new information, it doesn't solve real problems, if it, doesn't, if it has a whole lot of assumptions to prop it up, then it's not a very useful model. Well, yeah, my, this might be an explanation, but look, you've got all these assumptions, and you know, who knows whether they're right or not. But what you're looking for in a model is one that's useful, one that's productive, and one that has as few assumptions to support it as possible. Well, you have to have assumptions, because remember, you can't know everything. So you have to have assumptions. This has just one. Consciousness exists, and evolution exists. Those are the only two things you need. After that, everything is a logical deduction. OK, so just a model. Now, what about physical reality? So we've got consciousness. We've got us. Now, what about this physical reality? What is this physical reality? Why is it here? What are we doing here? What's about the universe? Well, to produce an effective, profitable interaction, right? These units of consciousness need to interact with each other. That's what they do, remember? That's what information system does. It interacts, it trades information, okay? In order to trade information, you need some constraints. You need some rules. Let me, let me put it this way. Imagine that you were in a, a, a monstrous chat room uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this chat room. A monstrous chat room, there were no rules. No particular subject, no rules, no responsibility. Nobody had to be responsible, no ethical, you know, how do you, you know, what are the, what are the uh, you know, kind of the, the way we behave here. No rules of behavior, no consequences for anybody doing anything, right? Now, what value would that be? Almost none, right? You couldn't believe anything you heard. You couldn't, you know, you wouldn't know. You, there was just no traction that you can get on anybody. It's just a bunch of communication going on without any rules or connection. So we need this physical reality because it's, 
it puts us in a game, if you will, with rules. It puts us in a situation where we have free will, where we have choices. We only need free will when we're in a virtual reality. When we're not in a virtual reality, you know, free will is, is, is not something that we need. We're just data, history, information at that point. You get into this game, into this virtual reality now where you interact with other consciousness. Now the free will is required in order for you to make a choice from your decision space that enables you to grow toward love. You see, you have all these choices, and some choices help you grow toward love, and some choices put you back more into fear. Ours are to make the right choices. That's how we evolve. So that's kind of how this is, this is working out. So all that is, our universe, the normal, the paranormal, morality, love, are all simply the logical consequences of evolution of a natural finite information system called consciousness. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, kind of the bottom line of all of that. I'll make one comment on the word consciousness. We use consciousness in two ways. And it's a little confusing. And I separate those two ways as big C consciousness and little c consciousness. Okay, big C consciousness is what I'm talking about. This big, the large consciousness system, right? That's the big C consciousness. Now, people, uh, particularly I suspect in, in uh, psychology, uh, but the, the, the population in general, sees consciousness as our personal little c consciousness. That's our awareness here in this virtual reality. And you see, that's different than the consciousness system. So we don't want to confuse those two. So um, the little c consciousness is really a subset. It's a subset of the big c consciousness that is constrained to only experience those things that the, the rule set of the virtual reality you know, says can happen. In other words, virtual realities have rule sets. Your character in World of Warcraft, that's a multiplayer virtual reality, can't walk through trees. Okay? If it falls off a cliff, it gets hurt. If it stays underwater too long, it drowns, etc. There are rules. Can't walk through rocks. Has to walk around them. Just like we can't. The rules have been put in there. So that's the rules of the virtual reality. And that virtual reality, for us, is an evolved virtual reality. For World of Warcraft, it's a programmed virtual reality. Our virtual reality wasn't programmed. It just evolved. How did it evolve? Well, the big virtual bang, right? This is a simulation. It's information. So you start in your simulation with this little tiny spot of high, you know, high energy, high temperature. You let it expand, and eventually in this simulation, it simulates a universe. And eventually in that universe, it simulates a sun and an earth and a planet. And then the evolution there takes forth, and you get cells, and then you get us. It's all part of a calculation. It's all part of a... That's what virtual reality means. Okay? So this is a simulation. So here you have the simulation, and it's evolved, not programmed. And now you have consciousness, and consciousness is going to play in this simulation, but it can only do so according to the rule set, the rule set that evolved. Now, what's the rule set? Well, the rule set's physics. You know, it's our science. It's, you know, gravity is part of the rule set. Okay? That you can't that these things are solid and you can't go through them. It's part of the rule set. Okay? So the rule set is our science, our physics. So that's how this thing evolved. And it's the same kind of Big Bang thing, except now we're doing it in a computer, you see. So here's this consciousness can play, just like you can play a, 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 your elf in World of Warcraft, but you have to abide by the rules. You constrain, you as a unit of consciousness, constrained to the rule set of this virtual reality is what makes your little C consciousness. It's the big C, a subset of the big C, constrained to the rule set of this particular virtual reality. And we'll talk more about virtual realities later. Okay, um, I guess later is now. <laughs> yeah. Virtual reality. Okay, multiple virtual realities. There are a lot of different virtual realities. Our virtual reality is not the only virtual reality. Some are more or less constrained. This one is constrained. That means it has a fairly tight rule set. Rules are pretty clear here. Okay? Uh, other virtual realities, like when you go out of body, or like when you die and you become aware in another virtual reality, they're all virtual realities, but they're different. They're less constrained. Every virtual reality has a purpose. 
you know, they were all created, if you will, for a specific purpose, and they're all there to give us experience. That's what you do in a virtual reality. You have experience. Why do you need experience? Because experience is what enables us to choose. Experience is what creates our choices. We go in and we mix it up and interact with all the other entities here, with all the stuff, and it creates, you know, it creates problems. It creates interactions. It creates choices that we have to make. And these choices are what allows us to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And that's our point. Because as we evolve, it evolves. So we're, we are part of the larger consciousness system's strategy to evolve. Remember, it's evolve or die. So here we are doing our part to help this thing evolve. So we evolve personally as well as evolve the system as we make choices that move us toward being love. Okay? But now it has to move you toward being love, not acting loving. It's not about what you do that's important. It's the intent behind the doing. The doing is really not so important as the intent behind it. So you can go around and be just as kind and nice as you like to everybody because you think that's the right thing to do, and there's no points gain. You're only going to help your evolution if you actually become kind. And that kindness that you're expressing is natural. It's you. It's the way you are. It's not because you think it's the right thing to do. You see, one is an intellectual process. The other is a being process. And we operate on two levels, an intellectual level and a being level. Growing up is about changing yourself at the being level. It's not an intellectual process. It runs deeper than that. So virtual means informational, computed. Okay, the virtual reality is relative to the actual reality where the computation is being done. So uh, dreams is another virtual reality where you go and you dream. Uh, if you read Bob Monroe's books, he talked about locale one, locale two, different places where he was out of body that he found. Those are all virtual realities. Where you end up after you die, that's a v another virtual reality with another purpose. It's a different purpose. We can talk about that later when we get to the questions if you want. They're all virtual realities. Evolution of the individual requires personal experience. And personal experience requires a virtual reality. So when you're in a virtual reality, you have free will, you have experience, you make choices, and you grow. You're giving. You're a part of the system that's working. The system evolves virtual realities for the use of its subsets and to evolve itself. Uh, Physical matter, reality, individuals may produce virtual realities based on information, and they can do that in their imaginations. You can produce a virtual reality in your mind, and they can do it in their computers, which we've seen. All right. Virtual reality mechanics. Uh, I'm going to do this one very quickly. It's just some, c some comparisons, but I'm comparing... Um, virtual reality games that we play like World of Warcraft and The Sims and there's probably a dozen other such games that you know about. My, my understanding of, of computer games stopped when my kids left home and went off to college and stopped playing them. You know, so I'm stuck at World of Warcraft and, and Sims. That's all I know. I'm sure if you're, young, if you're younger than me or have kids that are, you know, that are younger than mine, you probably know the names of a lot of other games that are being played these days. But it's just multi-user virtual reality games. And when you have questions about, well, I just don't understand how this could be a virtual reality, shift the question into World of Warcraft or Sims, and suddenly the answer will become obvious. We work the same way that works, pretty much. The big difference is their virtual reality was programmed, our virtual reality evolved. So ours is much more detailed, much more highly structured, you know. It's a lot different than the one that was programmed. All right. So um, that's really about all, and we'll get to, to some of that later, but um, we'll, we'll move on. So if, when you have problems understanding this reality is virtual reality, take the problem and say, well, what if the characters in The Sims had the same issue? You know, what would that mean there? And then you'll go, oh. I get it. And then that applies here. So that's just a good way to, to deal with, with this. All right, now this particular virtual, virtual reality that we're in is a probabilistic and statistical virtual reality. 
Okay, you can't really do virtual reality very well with all the all the data that you'd have to have if everything were specified exactly. See, it's too much data. Everything had to be specified, and that's some of the, the, the people who say, oh, virtual reality is impossible because, look, you'd have to have data specifying every atom and every molecule and everything. Well, you don't. This is a probabilistic statistical virtual reality. You only have to know how things generally work. You don't have to specify every detail. It's a much easier thing to do. Well, here's how this, this thing works. You have this reality. It's being simulated. If you know anything about simulations, or even if you don't, you can imagine that there's this bunch of code, and you go through this code, and it tells you what happens. And then you increment your clock one tick, which we just call delta t. That's some little chunk of time. And then you run through all the code again. And then you implement time, one tick, and you run through all the code again. And the code describes us, the virtual reality. What's going on here? So that's how simulations work. They just have a time loop. And every time they finish going through all the stuff that happens in the virtual reality, then they go back and they say, well, now what happened? What happens next? So this thing that was going in this direction, next delta t, is just a little further over there. And the next delta t, it's a little further again. You see, things go on. That's how dynamic simulations are done in computers. Okay. Well, the way this works is that here we are in the present. Okay, all the action happens in the present moment. That's where we make our choices. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we evolve is in the present moment. Okay, but before it gets to the present, and remember this present moves by delta t, well, from the present, we can guess with statistics and probability what might happen in the next delta t. Okay, we're in this delta t, and we can project, well, what do you think happened in the next delta t? Well, remember that thing that was going on out here? Well, we'd say, well, here it was, and it'll be out here next time. We can project what's going to happen. And we can project kind of what we're going to do, because after all, we're just, you, we're just collections of information ourselves, right? We have consciousness. We're a collection of information, history, attitudes, everything. And we've evolved up through multiple lifetimes. And we'll talk about that a little bit, too, to be who and are we are. So we have this huge database on who and what we are. All the decisions we've ever made, all the thoughts we've ever had, all the intents we've ever had. It's a pretty strong database. So you can kind of guess what's going to happen next. Well, you predict that. And then you say, well, given that that guess is true, what would you then think happened after that? And given that that's true, what would you think after that? And we just work out the probabilities. And that's what I call the probable future database. And you can run that out just as far as you like. Well, of course, you know it's going to make errors, right? It's going to think that this is probable, but somebody's going to do something that's not probable. Somebody's going to do one of those 10 sigma things that's, you know, one in a million, and that'll change it. Well, at that point, from that place on, you have to go back and recalculate. But probably most of the time, you're, you're mostly right on a lot of the things because, after all, they do have an awful lot of data on what's going on. They have all the data on what's going on. So... That is the probable future database. It's not done yet. It's just probable, what's likely to happen. So we can look at that probable future database and say, well, here's something that's really probable. That's a 0.9 in probability, and that's liable to happen 10 minutes from now or maybe 10 years from now. And there's other things that aren't so probable, that are very improbable, and some things that the probability isn't, is kind of mushy. It's not clear yet. You know, it's about as improbable or probable, you know, it's hard to say. So this is the probable future database. Then here's the present. Next delta t, okay, we get to make choices. Next delta t, we get to make choices. So now that's ours. We can make the choices. Then if we make choices that weren't guessed right, then that has to, that has to you know, work up through the system. The, the, the delta t that we had before, that drops down then into the history database. So all these delta t's as they flow through the present from the probable future to the present, down out of, the, you know, out of that to the history, then that is our history database. Now that history database comes in in a couple of flavors. One of them is everything we actually did. So it tracks what actually did happen, the choices we did make, and everything that we could have done but didn't. Because that's all there, too. Because in that probable future was all the things we could have done and the probability that we did them, that we would do them, you see? 
So it's not just tracing what they think will happen next, but it's tracing everything that could possibly happen next and the probability that it will happen next. So the whole probable future is this everything that could happen and assessed with probabilities of, of uh, how much you can happen. You say, well, that's a lot, everything that could happen. Well, this is a big system. Right? It's a very big system. Our virtual reality here isn't even necessarily the main game. It's just a game. It's just a virtual reality. It's one of many things that are going on. There's lots of these virtual realities for different purposes. Some of them are sort of like this one, you know, that with a, a kind of a tight rule set. But in any case, so it's everything that could possibly happen. It's still a finite number. Big, yes, but it's a finite number and it's probability. So that's the three databases that uh, we have. We have the probable future, and we have the past that's unactualized and actualized. Actually, that's just one database, but we break it into those parts. Okay, all of this, then, is data. Well, we are consciousness. We're part of this data field. All this data is available to us. Where do precognitive dreams come from? Well, they come out of that future probability database. Where do people who tell future, you know, whether they're reading the tea leaves or throwing chicken bones on the ground or, you know, whatever it is they're doing, you know, tarot cards, the stars, where does that information come from? It comes from the future probable database. Does that stuff absolutely have to happen? No, it's just stuff that's more probable than others. If you're good, if you're good at your prognostication, you're, you're reading the probabilities of that database. Okay, what you are in the larger consciousness system is information, data, and a probabilistic model of your history. So you as a character are in this history database, right? Because it's what you just did the last delta T is there. So you're there as a model in the string of delta T's. That model of you in the, histor in the history database does not have free will. It's not making choices. It's like data in a library. But there's a wonderful library that has, you know, all the information. And it's a living library like, like a movie, not just a, a simple, you know, catch of a word and maybe a picture. It's all of it. And you can go visit those databases. You can get that data. It's available to you because you're consciousness. You're part of the information set, and you have that available. Now, in the, the, I think it's the Hindu theology that's called the Akashic Records, and it's probably called other things in, in, other, in other places, but the data is just available to you because that's the way this reality works. So what you are is data and information. You get into a virtual reality, now you have free will, and you can experience. You add to that data set that you are. You evolve it. You lower its entropy. You see? That's what's going on here. So that leads us to a couple of ideas. One of them, of course, is reincarnation. And the logic behind that is that doing what we have to do, becoming love, growing up, it's not an easy thing, and it takes a long time. It's a learning, any kind of learning, whether you're learning you know, algebra or whether you're learning your alphabet or whatever. Learning is cumulative. Learning is not a one-shot deal. Learning is you learn something, and that enables you to learn a little more, which enables you to learn a little more. Well, here we are, units of consciousness. We're immortal. We're consciousness. We're part of this larger consciousness system. It's just a virtual reality. In this virtual reality, the rule set says that we get old and die. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with consciousness. That's just this virtual reality. So we go on. So why would we start over from scratch every time when learning is cumulative? We're evolving. Evolution is cumulative. You need to accumulate this being love. It's not a trivial thing to do. So you accumulate it. And why would you want to chop it into a bunch of, you know, 100-year experience packets? Because what happens is that you come here, and of course you end up with a lot of fears and beliefs and things. You eventually kind of work yourself into a corner where you're not being productive anymore. You've got this, oh, I've been there, I've done that, I know how it works. You know, there's no point. And you kind of get your world defined the way you think it is. You don't actually, you know, have a lot of openness to seeing things in a different way. So what happens is your potential for growth starts to get asymptotic, starts to level off. It's hard for you to break out of that, all those beliefs. All of those things that, you know, have kind of made you up. And it's good to 
stop that and start over because when you're young, you're open. The world is, is a mystery. It's magical. You're open to almost everything. And then eventually your culture kind of narrows you down and ties you up and tells you how it is and how it isn't and what to believe and what to not, and there you are. Okay, now eventually you want to discard that and start over again where the world is suddenly open to you again. So that's why it's important. You need to kind of start over. Now you don't start over on what you learn. Every bit of your evolution of the quality of your consciousness is retained. And when you come back, you start there. What isn't retained are the details of the virtual reality that you were in. But all that's irrelevant. You learn that again. You know, that's not important. You learn that again. What you lose isn't important. What you keep is what's important. That's, you know, what you lose is not important. What you keep is important. That's the quality of your consciousness. You evolving as a unit of consciousness. Or you might say as a spirit. Or you might say, as a soul. You know, we can use different words for this, but it's that evolution of you of consciousness is the key, and that is cumulative. Okay. So, obviously, here you are, and, and uh, you know, you get older, you get a disease, or you just get old, and you, you got dementia, you have other things. Would you like to continue on like that forever? You know, would that be a good idea? No, you got to stop. The rule set says that our bodies wear out. You want to stop, and then you want to continue because you have to continue for it to be cumulative. All right, let's do another one. Well, that's a funny little picture. That is, that's the way, uh, this is just a real quick series. This, these are pictures of, of the way we conceptualize our reality and why it is that it traps us. You see, here's us, that little happy face in the middle. That's, that's us. And these just funny shapes and things out here, that's everything else. Okay, that's other, there's a little upside down happy face and there's another one. Those are, those are kind of other people and these are other things and blobs and whatever. It's the rest of our environment. So it's us and the rest of the, the universe. Okay, well, we, somebody tells us that we are all one. Right? We're all one and we go, yeah, okay. I'm one with all that is. You know, and you got that. And then this is how you see it. That's how you see it. There's the one, and see, there's, there's you, and there's other, and other, and other. Mysteriously connected, but still separate. We really cannot conceive ourselves as one, because in our minds, for something to exist means that it's separate. You can't exist without being separate. If you weren't separate, you wouldn't exist, you see? So this is a cultural belief that we have comes right out of our culture. It's another one of those beliefs. So that's your problem of being with the one is that you put yourself up on a stick. Okay, now here it is. You say, well, okay, that's hard, but how about me and my higher self? Well, there it's the same old game, you see? There you are. There's the higher self, and there you are up there on that stick. Here I am, and up there's my higher self, and we communicate, but we're different. We're separate, you see? Again, it's just a cultural belief that you're separate, connected, but still separate. All right? Well, that's a better picture. There we are. Okay? That's what you are. Information, history, a potential within the one. Here's how we conceive of it. What's this? Well, that little B in, the, that's a little B in there, that says body. This is a term I use in my books, free will awareness unit. That's that little C consciousness. Next up here is the higher self, over soul. Um, there's lots of different words that, that describe that. And then up above that, I have this, the, the major subset, the individuated unit of consciousness. And up above that is the larger consciousness system, or God, if you will. Okay, so that gets, that gets that, you know, it's just this thing. Well, these are all arbitrary groupings. They're all metaphors. This is just how we slice and dice the words in order to give us something that we can talk about, you see? Because we can't talk about this unless we break it into pieces and put ourselves attached to it up on a stick. That's what's required because of our cultural beliefs. We can't see it this way, that we're just a potential, 
some information, history, a potential. And when we can do the system some good by evolving the quality of our consciousness, helping the system evolve, well, we get played in the virtual reality game. Right? And here we are. Now we have free will. We make choices, and hopefully we become moving toward love. We grow up. And it's really just this. So when, you know, think, of, think of who, you know, when you think of who and what you are, think of a file on your computer. Let's say you have a Word document on your computer. You pull up that Word document. What do you think that Word document really is? And where do you, how do you think that Word document fits in the computer? Do you think there's a whole bunch of little ones and zeros in a wad someplace that make up that Word document? No. Actually, the ones and zeros that make up that Word document are spread all over your hard drive because that hard drive is spinning, and it's just spitting ones and zeros all over the place, but it also spins a little trail that says how to, how to snatch them all up and put them back together again. But it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be efficient to put them all in one spot because it can only go in and grab a piece of data, grab a piece of data. And that thing's spinning. It'd have to wait till it went all the way around again before it grabbed the next piece of data. So it sprints them out all over the place. It's grabbing data as that thing goes around. So your Word document is a bunch of ones and zeros spread all over your hard drive. Sometimes that's how you have to defrag your hard drive, right? You try to collect things more in a, in a path so that it's more efficient for your hard drive to pick them up. Okay, well... What about you in the larger consciousness system? Are you just this, this little thing up on a stick? You know, this little, you know, this little chunk of, one, you know, of information? You're just a part of the one. You really are. Spread all over. You're not, you know, we, we think of ourselves in this physical reality as individuals. Think of yourself as just data in the mainframe. The mainframe's larger consciousness system. In my speak, and other people speak, it's God. But in my speak, the larger conscious system is just a natural, evolving system trying to succeed by lowering its entropy so it doesn't de-evolve. You see? So that's really where we're, where we're going here. So when you're in this larger consciousness system and you're just data, you don't need, a, you don't need free will. It's not you. It's not your little bunch of stuff. You really don't need free will because you're not in an experiential thing. Your nose doesn't need free will, right? Because you have it. It's just a part of your bigger system. You don't need free will when you're just one, just your data, because the larger conscious system has free will, and you're just a piece of it. But now you think you can evolve some, you can grow some toward love. Now we're going to put you in a virtual reality. Now suddenly you have interaction. You have experiential interactions with others. Now you have decisions in a decision space and free will to go along with your data set. You see? I know this is very abstract, and it's very difficult to get a grip on it, but I mean, I'm rushing through it, but that's all the, kind of all the time we have. I'm trying to make it so that at least you get a, probably give you a headache is what I'm giving you, but <laughs> hopefully you'll get, you'll get enough of it that it'll make sense to you later. Okay, now we'll get down a little bit to what does all this mean to us as individuals? How am I doing on time, by the way? Do I? Wow. I'm, I'm usually really badly overrun. You know, I hardly ever get done on time. But I think I'm going to make it on time this time. You know, lunch is important. <laughs> so we, we, don't want to, we don't want to be too, uh, too, too late here. Okay. So the key on this, this one is only you are responsible for who and what you are. And only you can change that result. Period. Our intent, this is another little fact I haven't told you yet, but our intent influences the probabilities in the future probable database. So remember, we have this database of all the things that could possibly happen and all the probabilities that they might happen. We can influence those probabilities with our intent. And we kind of know that intuitively. We, we know that people who are positive and up and have good attitudes, good things tend to happen to them. They tend to be, you know, things just fall out right. What do we call it? Synchronicity. Things just kind of happen that are good. People who are, oh, woe is me, you know, life sucks, everything is terrible, you know, struggle, struggle, struggle. Those people, what do they find? Struggle, 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 right? They have 
crap to struggle with all the time that they have to deal with. And that's because they are creating that reality. Okay? You create your, your own reality in, in several ways. Several ways that you create it. One, through your behavior. If you behave nice and pleasant and kind, people like you and tend to want to be around you and you share and things go nice. If you're, you, you know, if you're abusive, you use people rather than care for people. If you're mean, if you're, uh, you know, insulting and that kind of stuff, well, people don't like you and people don't help you. They're not, they don't want to be around you. They may even go out of their way to annoy you because you annoy them, you see. So in that way, you create your own reality. A second way you create your own reality is that your intent changes the probable future. That's how the placebo effect works. You get a person who intends to get well, they're more likely to get well than somebody that says, oh no, this is the end, I'm done now. You know, this medicine won't work, it never works for me. Well, that's why, because you're creating the reality where it doesn't work or where it does work. We create our own realities through that method. We create our own realities when we get that data. So here we are in a virtual reality, and the way that works is we receive data. Just like your elf in World of Warcraft gets data sent to your computer, which puts the image on your screen. We get data sent to us as a free will awareness unit, a little subset of big C consciousness, and that data gets put on our computer screen, right? This is it. This is, this is our computer screen here. This is virtual reality. This is our data. So we get that data. Everybody receives their own individual data stream. So every one of us gets a data stream. But it's, it's a multiplayer game. So just like in World of Warcraft where the elf and the, and the other person and whatever, the, you know, a bunch of them are working together, they all see the same things because it's a multiplayer game. The computer takes care of all that and it gives you the perspective of looking at me and this and me the perspective of you and, and what's out there. But it's all a multiplayer game, and the computer has no trouble keeping up with that. You know, we can even do that you know, with the little pokey computers we have. So it's, this, is our, this is our screen, if you will. What we're seeing is this reality. So we can change our reality with our intent. Um, that's also how mental healing works. That's also why uh, Dr. Tiller could raise and lower the pH. There's a lot of things working. He's just modifying the probable future with his mind. That's how this, uh, what do they call it, where, uh, you know, you program the universe to get you a new Mercedes-Benz. Um, the, um, yeah, the secret, the, uh, yeah, law of attraction. That's what it is. That's the way the law of attraction works. You know, of course, in cases like that, if you're really asking the universe for a new Mercedes, you're kind of working against your purpose, right? Your purpose is to let go of ego and become love, and now you're asking this system that's created to help you become love, to help you become ego. When you ask the system to work against itself, you're asking for trouble. You're likely, very likely, to end up with a lesson. The system does teach lessons, and you're very likely to end up with one if you ask the system to work against itself. Okay? But it is true. You can create the reality that you want. This reality that we see now, when you turn on the news and you look at the world and everything that's going on, of course, all they tell you about is all the horrible things because nobody wants to know about the good stuff, right? Well, all we want to know is what's horrible going on. All of that horrible stuff is because that's us. That's a reflection of who we are. You know, we created that reality. All our choices, the way we are, our intents, that's, you know, that's it. That's us. So that's, a, that's another way you, you change your, your reality, is to interpret the data. So here we're getting this data in. Every one of us has our own data stream that is then displayed on our screen, which is this virtual reality, and we interpret that data based on our history. What's in our, what's in our experience base, if you will? What's in our knowledge base and experience base? We interpret the data. Well, everybody has a different history, knowledge, and experience base. So everybody interprets the data differently. That's why, you know, women are from Venus and men are from Mars, right? That's one way we interpret the data differently. Well, we interpret everything differently. All of the data we get, once, it come, once we get the data, we interpret that data in terms of metaphors. That's what language is. Language is just symbols and metaphors. We interpret it in terms of language, symbols and metaphors that 
mean something to us based on our knowledge base, our experience base. Now we want to share that with somebody else. So we pour out to them message that is in terms of our experience and our database. They receive it and interpret it in terms of their experience and their database. You see, there is no way that you can share an experience with anyone. An experience is just yours. You can share a description of that experience with somebody, but you will share it in terms of your own metaphors, your own experience, your own knowledge base, and they will receive it in terms of their own experience and their own knowledge, you see, and base. So that's just the way it is. We all have our own unique line, if you will, to the, to the computer. We're all getting the database. It's a multiplayer game. So those are four ways, I think I said, that we make, we create our own reality. We create it because of how we interpret it. Some event goes on, and one person interprets it as, yay, that's a great thing. Somebody else says, oh, it's the worst thing that could have ever happened, right? It depends on how they interpret it. You have five people looking at an accident. You get five different accident reports. One said the guy was driving too fast, and one said he wasn't. Why is that? Well, the one person that said he was driving too fast, maybe they've got this belief that says accidents are caused by those people that are driving fast. So when he had an accident, he sees people driving fast because that's a belief. You see, so we, we, we're sharing part of ourselves when we communicate, when we talk. It's all individual. Okay, so we are individual. So we create our reality by our intent, Changes the probabilities, how we, how we uh, interpret the data we get by our behavior, how we act, and how other people then interact with us. Now, why is all that? Why do we have all that? Well, this is a learning lab. This physical universe of ours, this reality we're in, it's just a schoolhouse. It's not a graduate school. It's <laughs> not college. It's not even high school. It's a schoolhouse, and we're probably... You know, kindergarten, daycare, you know. We're just consciousness trying to learn. You know, we're struggling with this becoming love. I mean, obviously, look around. You know, how many people do you know have made it to becoming love? You know, they are just love. Well, not a lot of us, right? We hardly know anybody like that. So, yes, this is a, you know, a daycare for budding consciousness to grow up. All of these things, I'm saying how you make your own reality... Their feedback. What's a good schoolhouse do? It challenges you. You give your choices. You make your choices. And you get feedback about, is that a good choice or not a good choice? That's how you learn. All these ways I just numbered about how you create your own reality is your feedback. Do you like the reality you've created for yourself? If the answer is yes, then you're probably, you know, coming right along. If the answer is no, well... You need to change what you're creating. And it's not only us individual, but we as a species create a reality. We have to live in each other's mess, right? We have to breathe each other's air. So we create something as a species. We create something as an individual. If you don't like it, then the way to change it is to grow up. Many people don't come to that conclusion. They think that if you don't like it, the way to change it is to make that SOB over there change what they're doing and how they're doing it. Make them straighten up, you see. But that's not how you change it. You change it by changing yourself. That's the only way you can change it. You cannot force anybody else to grow up. Growing up has to come from the inside out. You can't make it go from the outside in. You can't tell really anybody anything that forces them to grow up. All you can do is you can give them an environment that encourages them to grow up themselves from the inside out. If you give them that kind of a, an environment, that kind of encouragement, that kind of support, that kind of love and security, then maybe they will change themselves and grow up. Whereas if you fuss at them and tell them that they're wrong and they know they're different, you're not helping them grow up. You're making them dig in deeper into what their problem already is, you see. So it's not, the problem isn't that person out there that's not doing it right. You know, if all those people would just change and do what I think they should do, you know, life would be perfect. That's not the answer. The answer is change yourself. All change starts there. 
you know, what did Gandhi say? Be the change, you know, be the change that you wish to see in the world. That's it. You know? Yeah, these things I'm telling you, it's not like, you know, you never heard them before, right? The things I'm telling you are, you know, truth is truth. There is but one truth. There are a hundred thousand ways of looking at that truth, expressing that truth, and a hundred thousand paths of getting to that truth. But there's only one truth. So, you, you know, this is not a brand new truth. You know, these truths have been known for you know, thousands and thousands of years. They come out of antiquity what you read, what's in antiquity, and it's in terms of poetry, mostly. You have to interpret it. It's not literal. You know, you can read the Bhagavad Gita, but it's not literal. Otherwise, it's about some guy in a chariot having a war, right? <laughs> That's not really what it's about. That's just the terminology, the metaphors that were, that were seemed reasonable at that time at those people. They used those metaphors, okay? But what it's about, of course, is Truth, trying to get at the same truth. So that's, I know, the Gita probably goes back three, four thousand years. You know, it's a it's very old, old manuscript. So these truths have been known, and people have worked their way up toward them now, for a long, long time. What I've done differently is I've put them in context of science. I've put them in context of a logical process rather than poetry, and in that logical process, out comes theology, metaphysics. And physics, all of it falls out. So it's, it's not that this is a new truth. It's not a new truth. Truth is truth. It's always been the same truth. It's a new approach. And it's a model. So what? How good's the model? Well, what does it do? You know, does the model help you out? Does it give you understanding? Does it enable you to see things that you didn't see before? Does it enable you to put things in better context? Does it enable you to work physics problems you couldn't work before? So on. That's how you decide whether the model's any good. It's not the only model. There's lots of models. And some models will be more suited to some people. So it's not that, you know, oh, this is the right model and it should gain dominance and all those models should go away. You know, that's silly. You want all these various models because various models speak to various people. But don't get, you know, you don't have to get tied into a model. Use a model that works for you and when it doesn't work so much for you, find another one. Better yet, build your own. Really, what this is about is not my big toe. It's about your big toe. It's about you building your own model. Okay, in a probabilistic reality, almost anything can happen in the margins, and often does. So this is a very uh, kind of uh, amazing, almost magical reality in a sense. Probably m most people in here have had some sort of uh, synchronistic event, something that just happened happened and came together just at the time they needed it. Uh, they've probably had some sort of paranormal event. They, they knew their child was hurt. They uh, knew their, you know, their mother-in-law was coming to visit. You know, they, uh, <laughs> you know, they knew something that was going to happen or they had a precognitive dream. There's lots of things like that. They went out of body, you remote view. All these things are not hard to do. Uh, healing with the mind, these are all easy things to do. It you can you know, you can teach anybody in a few months how to heal other people with their mind. It's not a hard thing. It's just intent. Modifying the future probable reality. The only trick in it is you need to get that intent clean, clear, and focused. And most of our minds are so full of jabber and noise and stuff going on that they're not very focused. So our intent is not very focused. And if your intent's not very focused, the effect of your intent's not very focused. So that's really the, the only thing to practice. And we do that through meditation. But meditation isn't about learning something new. It's not like, oh, I have this new process I need to learn. It's meditation, and it's going to allow me to do things. Meditation isn't a new process. It's a process that helps you get rid of all the things that are blocking what you have the natural ability to do. That's what you're doing. It's getting rid of the fear, getting rid of the beliefs, getting rid of the expectations, getting rid of all that junk. And now you have a mind that's clear and not full of fuzz and noise, and you can have a very powerful intent that can modify things. Okay, so that's the key. There's, it's not just your intent. It's not like making a wish. You know, it's, it's not that simple. Making a wish is perhaps a very, very weak intent. But you can make that intent a lot more focused. And that's the, that's the key there. Uh, so what we're supposed to do here is, is get rid of fear, ego, and beliefs. 
That's the key. I define ego as the expression of one's self in terms of one's fear. For most of us, our ego is our intellectual and emotional awareness of our individual self because most of us are defined by our fear. Okay. We are defined in terms of needs, wants, our desires, our expectations, our insecurities about being lovable, competent, adequate, about being appreciated, about getting approval, being successful, being considered successful by others. Fear is always about self. You see, all these things were, right, about self, right? They're all about you. Your needs, wants, desires, expectations, things you need to have. Love is always about other. Fear is always about self. The ego's main job is to sweep our fear under the intellectual rug and out of sight. That's what it does for us. That's what it does. That's why we need that ego. That's so we can pretend that the fear isn't really there. So if, let's say, we're afraid that people won't like us and people will shun us, then maybe one of our reactions to that would be to be a bully to where we, well, if they're going to shun us, we'll get in their face, right? And then if they reject us, well, that won't hurt because, of course, they would reject us because we're being a bully. So that rejection won't hurt so much, you see. Our ego is a way to get rid of the fear, to deal with the fear. Most of us are driven by fear. Most of us, our lives are dominated by our ego. And we're here to stop that, really. We're here to grow toward love. In order to become love, it's not, again, it's like meditation. You don't have to learn something clever to have a focused intent. You just have to get rid of all the junk to have a focused intent. You don't have to be really clever to become love. You just have to get rid of the fear, ego, beliefs, expectations, all that junk. Once you get rid of that, guess what? You are love once you get rid of that. See, that's what you are. You just need to get all the stuff out of the way and be love. So that's where we're, that's where we're going. Awareness of one's existence at the being level and directing that awareness is not ego. So, you know, the old uh, statement uh, that comes out of philosophy from Descartes, 1600s maybe I'm just guessing maybe even before that I think therefore I am that's not a statement of ego see that's just a statement of fact right it's not a statement of ego so you have to realize that when I say you need to get rid of ego that doesn't mean that you become a zombie you know that you have no sense of self you know you don't know who you are you know you know you're just walking through the world blank because you have no self-concept that's not what we're talking about, ego. Remember, I define ego as expression of oneself in terms of one's fear. It just turns out that that's really what drives most of us. So we think, well, what's ego? Well, ego is kind of our sense of ourself. Well, if our self is mostly driven by fear, then, yeah, that's what, that's what the ego is. It's how we are. And some people will tell you that, that ego is necessary. If you don't have some ego, people will walk all over you. You need to be able to push back. You need to be able to, you know, take care of number one, right? This ego is important. We don't want to get rid of it. Well, that's not so. You gain power by being loved. There's nothing about getting rid of ego that requires you to be a pacifist. You are required not to, well, let's put it this way, you are required to respect other person's free will. We all have free will, and you should respect the free will of others. But if others do not respect your free will, then you, and if they don't expect the free will of those that say you have to protect, like your children, right, then you can protect yourself. You know, that's not a problem. You don't have to be a pacifist. Look at the people who had power in this world, power to change things. Who do you know who was really powerful and changed things? Well, here we are in Atlanta. What about Martin Luther King? Did he change anything? Oh, yeah, he changed a lot, didn't he? He changed a whole culture in a very short amount of time, turned it around and got it moving in a more productive... That was a hard thing to do. Why did he do that? Because it wasn't about black versus white. It was about being human, about, you know, 
we're all one here, guys. Let's work together. You know, it was that kind of an attitude. It was a, an attitude that floated above the general level of consciousness in the society. And he pulled a lot of people up with him. What about Mahatma Gandhi? He didn't chase the British out with guns and explosions and guerrilla warfare. He chased them out with love, by caring. He said, well, we're going to do what we need to do. And if you don't like it, you'll just have to shoot us. And the British couldn't do that. They were moral enough that that was not an acceptable solution. So they left. It was basically that simple. That was courage. That was love. That was caring. So if you look at who's, who's powerful in the world, who's really done big things, you'll find things like that. Things that have lasted. What King has done, what Gandhi's done, um, what uh, Mandela did in South Africa. You see, these things are lasting. We're still evolving on King's legacy. We're still evolving on Gandhi's legacy. We're still evolving, you know, on Mandela's legacy. There. It's like it goes on and on and on and adds. Okay, what about the people who really made changes in the world that weren't so good, like maybe Adolf Hitler? It comes, it goes. Are we still evolving on, you know, the legacy of Adolf Hitler? No. Came was a flash in a pan, a lot of noise, flashes of light, and it's gone. It doesn't last. It's not really powerful in the big picture. It's very feet. So yes, evil, if you will, can make changes. That doesn't make evil powerful in the big picture. It just makes it a nuisance in the little picture. We need to deal with that the best way we can. We need to make choices so that even in the face of something that's not nice, we can grow the quality of our consciousness. Take a look at... Um, well, now, you know, it's awful when you get old and you don't remember things, but uh, take, take a look at the, um, the man, you'll, you'll tell me in just a minute, who wrote the book. He was, he was uh, captured, he was Jewish, he was captured by Nazi Germany. Yeah, Viktor Frankl, take a look at Viktor Frankl. Look at what he had to endure. What happened to his family? What happened he, he endured? And what happened, what did he do with it? He grew. He became more. He moved toward love. He saw bigger pictures. He didn't wad up into hate or recrimination or vengeance or, you know, dissipated as, you know, become a basket case. He didn't do any of that. He used that to make good choices for good intents. And he created out of it. You see? So even those horrible things give us opportunity to create, give us opportunity to grow. The way the world works for us here is that stuff happens and we deal with it. How we deal with it is our choice. Our choices decide whether we evolve or de-evolve. So it's just that simple. And it doesn't matter a whole lot what it is that happens, what creates our choices, but choices happen and we deal with it. Those, some of those bad things give us some very powerful choices that help us grow. Some of those good things allow us to sleep and don't challenge us very much. And all of that, unfortunately, comes down to the fact that we tend to be more motivated by pain than we are by pleasure. A good swift kick in the butt will get our attention, whereas if everything feels great and it's going really well, well, let's just kind of lay back and enjoy it, right? It doesn't give us a lot of, say, well, this is good, but let's do better. You know, hardly anybody feels that way. This is good, let's enjoy it. So what happens is that just because we are the way we are, because this is an elementary school or a preschool and not a graduate school, we tend to learn better with pain. If it really squeezes us, when we hit the bottom of that barrel, we start looking for, what's wrong here? Something's got to change. I've got to do something differently. We start opening up and looking. As long as we're in charge and everything's fine, then we kind of let it roll the way it's going. So that's, you know, when you look at, bad things that happen and challenges that we have in our life, you have to see them from the positive viewpoint. It's our opportunity to grow. Things happen, we deal with it. Some of the times those things are horrible things, they're awful things. You know, a child dies. You know, you, somebody you love gets run over by a truck. Things happen. But you deal with it in ways that are profitable to you. Not in ways that increase entropy, but ways that decrease entropy. That's what this life is about. It's not about feeling good. Not about how much you can accumulate, how rich you get, you know, how much beer you can drink. You know, it's about 
how much you grow toward love. And almost anything can help you grow toward love. If Victor Frankl can grow up and have the, the largeness of heart and attitude that he had, then very few of us will ever meet circumstances as dire and as depressing as Victor Frankl. And let's hope that that's the case. But even if we do, then ours is a challenge to take that and make something positive out of it. Okay, what about truth? Uh, searching for truth. Open-minded skepticism is my suggestion of how you go about finding truth. Now, open-minded skepticism says that you're open to almost any possibility, but you're skeptical. And your skepticism has to be based on your own experience because if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. If it's not your personal experience, it can't be your personal truth. So you have to be open. That's the problem I have with belief. I have a lot of people say, I thought belief was good. You know, you wanted to have belief and you want to have faith in things and believe in them. Well, the problem with belief is, and when I use belief, I use it in a kind of a special way. And I find that other people can use belief and what they mean is open-minded skepticism. So you can use belief in different kinds of ways. The thing about belief is that the way I use it is that if you believe it, you're done. You're no longer open to it being any other way. Now, this is the way it is. This is my belief. It's going to be this way. And any data to the contrary, wrong. Any data to the contrary, I don't want to hear it because I have this belief. Okay. Now, we, we call that kind of fundamentalism, right? This kind of fundamental belief that you just get focused. Well, that's, the kind of, that's what I mean by belief. Belief that is exclusive. Belief that does not any longer open up to the possibility of being wrong. Whereas open-minded skepticism says, I'm open. I'm skeptical. But now here, let's say I think that this is true to 99.99%. So I really believe that this is the way it is. You see, I really think it's true. But maybe not, because I don't know everything. And I don't understand everything. And I haven't had every experience. Therefore, there may be information that would change my mind. So I'm not going to say that's a one, because once I say it's a one, then it's inevitable. It just is. Now it's a belief. But as long as I'm skeptical, a little bit, I'm open to new ideas. I'm open to new information. You see, I don't get closed off. So I see belief as a trap. If, you're, if you have a belief, you're trapped. You have a limitation. Here's the wall. You can't go past that wall because that interferes with your belief. And even if you get pushed that way, you'll turn, you know, you'll turn around and look the other direction. You won't want to deal with it. Some people, though, use belief in a different way. I've run into other people who will say, well, you know, I don't really necessarily 100% believe this. I sort of believe it. This is what I believe, but I could be changed. You know, well, they're not using belief the same way I am. They're using belief as what I'm calling, you know, open-minded skepticism. They're open. So it's just, you know, it's how we use the word. We can use belief in a lot of different ways, you know. That, uh, so it's not really the word belief. Let's not get too tied up around a word, you know. We're talking about metaphors here. So if there's a belief that shuts you off, if it makes it difficult, even if it doesn't shut you off entirely, but it just makes it difficult for you to see past that, then it's a problem. It's a limitation on your ability to think, and it's not helpful. We have beliefs about this being an objective reality. That's why it's so hard for everybody to see this as a virtual reality, as information, as a simulation. It's so difficult because we have a belief that this stuff is solid. How could this be information? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. We believe we have to be up on that stick because we can't see ourselves as a part of a whole because it's just part of our culture. It's part of our virtual reality. In virtual reality, everything is separate. So we just believe that's the way it has to be. These are just beliefs. A lot of our beliefs are not in the intellect. Most of our fears are not in the intellect. These are not things. They're not fears we know we fear. They're not beliefs we know we have. Most of our beliefs and fears are down at the being level, beneath the intellect. It's very difficult for somebody to know their fears. So, I, you know, I say, well, what you need to do is get rid of your fear. When you get rid of your fear, you automatically get rid of your ego, your expectations, and your beliefs. 
belief being a, a, a product of fear, just like ego is a product of fear. The reason belief, again, it's belief the way I'm saying it here, the way I'm using it, belief is a product of fear because people fear the unknown. They fear uncertainty. It makes them feel uncomfortable if they don't know, particularly for something important that affects them, and they don't know, they're uncertain about it. Well, how do you fix that? You make a belief. Well, that takes care of that uncertainty. You know, now I've got the answer, and I believe it. Uncertainty's gone. Well, that's true. The uncertainty is gone, but so is the opportunity to ever learn anything more. It's gone with it, you see. So that's how we deal with uncertainty. And people will come sometimes to, this, uh, to a lecture like this, and the reason they're here is to decide whether or not they should believe what I say or not. You see, well, should I believe it or not? Well, that's the wrong approach, you see. I don't want you to believe it. You know, that's a strange thing, right? I don't want anybody to believe what I say. What I want you to do is consider it, think about it, and with open-minded skepticism, see if it does you any good. Is there any value in it? Is there anything you learn from it? And maybe there'll be just pieces. Oh, yeah, this piece is some value. That part, nah, not so much. You know, that's fine. Then it's done something useful. You see, it's not should I believe it or not. That's an approach to life that says I don't like uncertainty. I fear. That's a fear. I fear uncertainty. Therefore, I want to know, should I believe this? Should I believe that? You know, you read Carlos Castaneda's books, right? They were very popular years back. I don't know if they're still in print or not, but people would read those books and they say, do you believe it? Well, they read, read Bob and Rose books. Can you believe that? That out-of-body stuff? Can you believe what Carlos Castaneda wrote? I don't know whether I should believe it or not. And that was the big deal, whether or not you should believe it. You see, that's the wrong approach. It doesn't matter whether what Carlos Castaneda wrote was an actual experience, a dream, or he just made it up because he thought it would sell books. It makes no difference. If you read it and get something valuable out of it, that's what makes the difference. You see? Let's say he just made it up to sell books, but you read it and get something out of it. It helps you grow. You see connections to things. Then it's good. And let's say he actually had every one of those experiences and he wrote them down perfectly, accurately, and you read it, and you don't get a damn thing out of it. It doesn't help you. So what's the difference? You know, what, what, did it, what did it matter to you that he wrote it down exactly the way it happened? You see, it, it's not important. It's not a matter of belief or not believing it. That's the wrong question. Is, is this valuable? Is this useful? Is this model any good? You know, well, Carlos Castaneda kind of came up with a model of reality in his books from his, his uh, sorcerer, Don Juan, that he found in Mexico. Is that model good? Did you get something from it? Now, the model doesn't have to be perfect. It can maybe just give you one thing, and that's good. Take that one thing from it. Maybe it'll give you two things or three things or maybe nothing at all. Use what you can use. Don't, uh, you know, it's all a tool. So this idea, should I believe it or not, is basically our fear of the unknown and fear of uncertainty forcing us to want to put things into categories, put everything in a box, that's settled. Now, I don't have to think about that anymore. Well, you don't have to think about it anymore, but you'll never grow anymore either in that direction because you come to a belief. That's why I add beliefs in there when I'm talking about all the things that come from fear. You know, sometimes people say, well, why, does, you know, why, is, why are you hard on beliefs? You know, beliefs are good things. You know, we believe in motherhood and apple pie and, you know, things like that. But the belief is not good in my sense because it's a, it's a reaction to fear and you need to let it, let it go. I tell you to give up fear, ego, expectations, beliefs, and so on. Well, how do you go about doing that if most of them are undercover? Most of them are down below your intellect. Well, fears are mostly below your intellect. I mean, some of you know the fears you have, and you can work on those, but most of your fears are below your intellect. Most of your beliefs are below your intellect. You don't really know that you have them. But there is one thing that is just as obvious as anything, if you care to look at it, and that's ego. Ego's just right out there all the time. All you have to do is look. You make thousands of choices every day. You just have to look and say, is this choice, is it about me? You know, is it about me or is it about others? You'll find that most of them are probably about you, what you want, what you need, what you think is right. And if most of your choices are about you, 
And most of your, you know, what's important to you is about you. Are you getting what you need? Are you getting what you want? Are those people acting the way you want them to? And you may think that it's somebody else. Well, I just want them to do the right thing. I know what's best for them. I know that, you know, that they're having this problem. And if they just think about it differently, they'd feel so much better. So, you know, I want them to be different. Well, it's your want. I want. You know, I want them to be different. It's still ego. See? It's not the... So if you see that your life is basically out of ego, that's easy. Say, well, okay, where's that ego come from? It comes from a fear. Why do I want them to change because that, you know, they need to? It's because I fear that if they don't, you know, this and this will happen to them. Well, where does that fear come from? Travel your fear back and deal with the fear. Well, our job isn't to rearrange reality the way we like it. That's not our point here. Remember? Our point here is to grow up and become love. Our point isn't to feel good, collect money, drink beer. Our, 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 you know, that's, not what we're point, that's not what we're here for. Our, we're here to grow up. And everybody has to grow up from the inside out. You can't force anybody to grow up. So you, you begin to realize that you need to let go of control. Stop trying to control everything to be the way you know it really should be. Just control yourself. Reduce your own ego. Reduce your own fears and beliefs and things. And that's the way you're going to help those people. Because then you will be an example. Then you will, be, you will have their trust. They will know you're not just trying to manipulate them to get them to do what you want them to do. They'll believe that you're really doing it because, you know, it's just the way you are. You care. It's at a deep spot. It makes a difference. So find the fear. Look for the ego. Ego is a, is a sore thumb. You know, it's a red bullseye. It's easy to find. Mostly, it's almost everything we do every day. So it's hard to miss. Okay? Find the ego. Trace it back to the fear. Get rid of the fear. Sometimes you'll trace it back to a belief or an expectation. Well, I expected you to be different. You know, I expected you to bring me flowers on my birthday. I expected this, and now I'm upset. Now I'm unhappy. Well, you're, if you ever feel upset and unhappy and angry and all of those things... That's ego. That's fear. So right away, you know, you found another ego and another fear. Something upsets you. Somebody irritates you. It's your ego. Okay, you can't be irritated without that ego. So anyway, that's how, you go about, that's how you go about doing it. So if you come here looking for me to give you objective physical proof, say, of the non-physical, then you're wasting your time. Can I help you experience, say, a psi phenomena for yourself? So you can come to your own conclusions? Sure, I can do that. Can I teach you how to affect physical things with your mind? Sure, that's not hard to do. Can you absolutely, objectively, and conclusively prove the reality of those experiences to yourself? Sure, you can do that. Will your experience serve as objective proof for anyone else? Not a chance. You see, that's the thing. You have to do it yourself. It's not something anybody can demonstrate to you or do for you. You have to do it yourself. So instead of believe or disbelieve, consider the possibilities, assess the probability, and uh, use open-minded skepticism until you collect enough of your own data to find out. So there's very few things you should be certain of. There's lots of things that you should have some skepticism or uncertainty about, and don't feel like you have to fill that uncertainty in with a belief in order to resolve your, your uncertainty. Don't be fearful with uncertainty. Learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. That's one of the primary things for getting along in this world is learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. All right. In dealing with other people, this is kind of obvious, but good communications, you have to start, if you're going to try to help somebody else find an opportunity, right? You can't teach them. You're not going to force anything, but you want to help them find an opportunity, the way you help somebody else find an opportunity is with communications, but you always have to start from where they are. If you start from the idea, here's where I am and I know, so I'm going to tell them the information and bring them to my knowledge, that doesn't work. You have to go from where they are with their knowledge, their fears, their ego, their whatever, and that's where you have to start. That's where the opportunity has to be delivered is to them at their level, in their language, which means 
in terms of their own ego, fear, knowledge, whatever. That's a communication. Trying to get other people to see it your way is not a communication. That's just, you know, an ego trying to collect agreement. Well, I think we've done the whole thing, ladies and gentlemen. Are we on time or is it about lunchtime? 20 after? Oh, well, at least I'm consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.